Omar, can you hit Reggie up with the info? He's on. He's on. Okay, cool. Hey guys. Hello. Hey. Hello. Hey, Debbie. Hey, I'm going on mute though, guys. Yep. Hi, everyone. This is Ronita. Hello, welcome. Thank you. Where's Tiffany Ray? Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. For those of you who have joined us Hello. already, we're, hi Abdo, we're so glad you're here. It's great to see some of your faces. Um, we're gonna ask that uh, for us to get underway, if you wouldn't mind um, muting your audio and stopping your video. We wanna make sure that we can focus our speakers uh, for the top portion of, of the town hall. Thank you, thank you. I see it happening now. <laughs> <laughs> hey Shane. Great. Hey, how are you? Good. How Sorry, are you? I got in here late. That's all right. Glad to have you. Good evening. Good evening to those of you that are just joining. Um, also, those of you joining by phone. Um, for the first part of our evening, we're asking that you will please mute your audio and pause or stop your video um, so that we can focus our speakers onto the video window. Uh, to do either of those things, if you uh, take your mouse toward the bottom left corner of your screen. You'll see the mute and the stop video uh, buttons. You can just click right on them and that'll take care of it for you. Good evening. Thanks to everyone that's joining. We're really glad to be here with you. My name is Adriana Ray. I'm the development director at IEBD. I'm just doing a little housekeeping here before we get started. Good evening for those of you who are just coming on the line. Um, we're asking that you please mute your video, or I'm sorry, stop your video and mute your audio so that we can focus the speakers into our video window. When we switch over to Q&A and more conversation, um, we want to see everyone's faces. We want to we want to feel like we're together in some way other than just this virtual moment we have right now. But for now, if you could stop your video, please. Um, we're going to get started in the next couple of minutes here and while we are holding and getting situated uh, just a few quick notes um, this will be recorded we have already started recording um, and we hope to make this conversation available to you all in the next 24 to 48 hours um, we will have time for question and answer um, and some other conversation um, but we encourage you to use the uh, zoom chat feature to submit your questions as we go. So um, especially if they're really geared toward a, a specific speaker this evening, uh, we wanna make sure that, that we're capturing that and we can um, do our best to facilitate that question and answer period. Uh, the chat feature, if you're in the video window from the app is um, on the bottom, just center to the right of the green share screen button. Uh, if you're calling in from your phone and you are on the app, You'll see it when you click um, in the bottom right, there's a, an icon that says more and you open it up and there's a chat feature there. We will also uh, hold time for questions for those of you who have joined us by phone um, and you're just calling in. Um, and as always, if, if you have a question or you'd like to maybe send something privately, if you're able to access email, a great way to do that would be through the contact at iabdassociation.org email. Again, this is being recorded and we hope to make it available in the next 24 to 48 hours. And we will make sure that we're posting um, not only the conversation, but any resources that are mentioned, any question and answer responses. If we don't get to your question, we hope to be able to include it at that time as well alongside the recording. And if you're experiencing any technical difficulties or have any other questions or things you'd like to send our way, uh, we ask that you use the contact at iabdassociation.org email address. I'm going to drop all of this information into the chat, but just a quick reminder that uh, as we get underway here, we're asking that you um, mute your audio and stop your video so that we can focus our speakers into uh, the video screen. All right, thanks everyone for joining. We're looking forward to a great time.
Great, thank you, Adriana. We're gonna get started in just a moment. We're just trying to get one more speaker. Uh, well, actually two more speakers uh, on the call. Good evening, everyone. This is Adriana Ray. I'm the development director with IABD. I'm just checking in. I see a few new uh, folks have joined us. Um, we're asking that you just um, keep to uh, muted audio. And if you'll stop, have your video stopped for now. Um, when we switch into um, Q&A, we'll uh, shift things around. But we want to make sure we can focus our speakers for the top portion of the evening. Um, and we're just waiting just a couple more minutes here before we get started. Um, if you are able to access the chat feature, I started to drop in just some, some quick notes in the chat that we went over in the first few minutes here. Uh, and we will be, um, as the IAB team, following uh, the chat feature as well as checking um, contact at iabdassociation.org uh, to make sure we're capturing any questions or, or concerns or anything that comes our way um, and getting that information over to the speakers. So uh, we look forward to a uh, conversation here to get underway uh, shortly. Thank you, Aquarelle. I saw you. <laughs> we don't need to escalate. War is not the answer for only love. Can you all hear me? I cannot hear anything. I hear you. I don't know if you can hear me. Can you hear me, Denise? Mm -hmm. Yes. This is Anne. Mm -hmm. Hello, Miss Anne. Hi, how are you? Good. I'm going to go ahead and mute myself now. Okay. Reggie, uh, I just want to confirm that you were. At, Denise, can you go on mute one second? Reggie, I want to confirm you are on. Yep. All Reggie's right. here, yes. Denise, you're good to go. Great. Do we have Andrea on as well? Great. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Hello, Cleo Parker Robinson. Oh, good. Okay, girl. I, you know, this is challenging for me. <laughs> <laughs> Andrea is saying she can't hear anybody. She cannot hear anyone. Andrea, um, is your sound all the way up? You all can hear me, right? Give me a thumbs yeah. up. Okay. Yes. So I'm going to log out and I'll log back in and I'll see if that works. Okay. 
Okay. Okay. Thank you. All right. All right. I'll, I'll be just right give back. her one more moment because she's one of our, our guest speakers. Thank you so much, everyone, for your patience. Andrea, I see you're back. Can you hear me talking now? How I can't, are, is anyone talking besides me? Can you hear me talking now? Let's ask her if she could dial in on the phone. Then that way she could hear. Okay. All right, I'm gonna. She can hear us, but she. All right, I'm gonna join by phone. Yeah. We can hear her. Yes, but she my sound is all the way up completely. All right, <clears throat> I'm gonna see if I can. I'm gonna mute myself and I'm gonna try and join by phone now. Thank you so much. Sorry, I'm so sorry. Let's see, I just changed my settings. Let's see okay. if it, yeah. Sarah? Did that work? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, wonderful. <laughs> Great. Thank Great. Thank you everyone so much for being here tonight uh, at the IABD Town Hall evening, uh, Town Hall meeting this evening. My name is Denise Saunders Thompson. I am the president and CEO of the International Association of Blacks and Dance, and we are so happy that you have joined us tonight. Um, these are certainly unprecedented times, as we all know, and we here at IABD wish you all continued good health, love, and support. We know that it takes a village, and this village has your back and is one that you can always call upon. This organization, its board of directors, and the staff is here for you. Uh, on the IBD website are resources regarding the COVID-19 pandemic. We are keeping this information updated and as real time as possible. And so as we receive new information, we are posting it to our site. If you have uh, needs and concerns and just want more information, please visit the site where you will be able to um, find more of what you're looking for. That is at IABDassociation.org and then forward slash COVID-19. Before I get started, I have to really just say to my amazing IABD team, thank you, thank you, thank you. Carol Foster, Omar Ingram, Vanessa Leveros Hall, Taran Moore, Tiffany Pittman, Adriana Ray, Taisha Munnerlin, Nasani Lopez, and Whitney Coleman. Thank you. They are all here tonight supporting this event, and I am extremely grateful. So let's get right to it. Um, IBD is a service organization that preserves and promotes dance by people of African ancestry or origin and assists and increases opportunities for artists on advocacy, audience development, education, funding, networking, performances, philosophical dialogue, and touring. This is a network of people, of organizations, and we are here to support and initiate dialogue um, for issues that impact the Black dance community, but also the dance community at large. And of course, this issue is a global issue of big prominence and we are here and we've come together to find ways to move forward and ahead during these times. I'm so happy tonight that we have this amazing and esteemed panel of individuals in the field of nonprofit services, business, philanthropy, arts education, and arts presenting. They have all agreed to be here to support 
our community and engage in a discussion in a conversation tonight uh, with me about the effects of COVID-19. It's impacted all of us in ways that we never thought were possible, but here we are, we're coming together to talk about what steps one might take to preserve what they have left, because some people have very little left, how we can support one another, support ourselves, our organizations, and the field. So panelists, when I call your name, if you're on video or would you come to video, please just give a wave in the screen so that you can identify yourselves. First is Andrea Briscoe, who is Vice President of Talent and Organizational Effectiveness uh, with the Nonprofit Fund, Nonprofit Finance Fund. Thank you, Andrea. Shane Fernando, Executive and Artistic Director of the Wilson Center. Thanks, Shane. Carol Foster, IEBD Special Programs Assistant and Performing Arts Readiness Circuit Rider. Y'all wanna know Carol's name, I'm letting you know. <laughs> Dominique Hug, who is manager at Nonprofit Finance Fund. Reggie Van Lee, Chief Transformation Officer with the Carlisle Group. I'm just what? audio, sorry, not on video. No problem, thank you, Reggie. Thank you for being here. Antrella Walker, Associate Director, Advisory Services, the Nonprofit Finance Fund. Thank you. So we're gonna go right to it. I'm gonna start with Carol Foster. Uh, about a year ago, IBD received a uh, grant from the Lyricist um, Performing Arts Readiness Program. And we began to deliver services just around this topic, this, this situation that we're in right now, emergency preparedness. Um, Carol and IBD went through an amazing um, process of learning and really educating ourselves about emergency preparedness and continuity uh, business plans. So I'm going to have Carol kind of start off our conversation here and give a recap and then some information to us all around emergency preparedness. Carol? All right. Thank you, Denise. Well, I'm so pleased that we're having this town hall. It is an amazing event. Um, sorry about how we got here. <laughs> but it is something that is most needed. For over a year now, IBD has been unknowingly ahead of the curve, uh, trying to spread new needed awareness around emergency preparedness. We've attended training, provided presentations, uh, done workshops, consultation, consultations, risk assessments, and developed a much needed comprehensive emergency plan template for the arts community. Now this plan, it's there, it's the first iteration of it. Uh, it's a working document. Still, it is a clear guide for dance and arts organizations. We are eternally grateful for our partnership with the Performing Arts Readiness Project and the new skill set it provided the IEBD organization. Now, most of us on the emergency preparedness side thought, well, we were prepared, but the coronavirus pandemic presents challenges that no one expected or planned for. Now a simple thing like having a closet full of toilet paper brings us solace and comfort. So with the possibility of being shuttered for weeks, maybe months, what can we do and where do we go from here? Fortunately, we can provide some guidance that can be applied immediately as well as long-term. So I have a limited amount of time, but I'm going to just quickly outline some specifics that might assist you. Number one, the coronavirus. Be knowledgeable. We've been bombarded with a lot of information. I think we all know to wash our hands, but please be safe and be protected. Protective measures. Protect yourself, your family, your staff, your dancers, students, teaching staff, parents, Anyone you come in contact, be thoughtful. Consider crisis communications and business continuity planning. Work remotely and keep everyone informed. Communicate, communicate, communicate. Staying open. The show must go on, but it can't. If you consider opening on the down low, because you know some of us are rogue, <laughs> if you do consider it, 
please think about it. You are taking unnecessary risk. Understand you open your business, yourself, your community. It's very, very unnecessary. And you open yourself to a lawsuit and your liability insurance will not cover it. Pillars for emergency management. This is number four. Please know them. Uh, some people take them take the pillars to five or six, but I'm going to just do four. That's mitigation, preparedness, response, recovery. This is the time to plan. You have time now. God has put us on pause. We are all retired for a moment. The formula I advise is also suggested by a lot of leading nonprofit resources, such as the Chronicle of Philanthropy. Scenario planning, that's the key. Scenario planning for COVID-19. What are your plans A, plan B, plan C? There are a lot of templates out there for crisis communication and business continuity. However, if you are an IABD member, we've done the legwork for you and can assist you right now. Number five, how will the closures impact your livelihood? loss of income. We all need immediate solutions. We need the short term, the midterm, the long term. Be creative. There is an overwhelming list of resources to wade through. I'm still uh, myself searching and hope to be able to pinpoint some of the most critical ones for dance studio school communities. Um, I, I want to add here to give parents and students a minute because some of us are trying to rush and put classes uh, right in there. But give it a minute because everybody's trying to decompress from all this and parents are getting bombarded by emails and work on this distant, distance, distance learning from their schools. So just give it a minute and then dive in to what we have to do for our dance studios and schools. Uh, think about loss of income insurance. Uh, perhaps this is a good time for you to go to the PAR website, utilize the webinars, they're there. Uh, they have a loss of income calculator. So when you have to ask for assistance, you will have reliable figures. Number six, and most importantly, what is your recovery strategy? Start strategizing now for recovery and what that will mean for yourself, your company, your studio, your organization. Be vigilant. New information is coming out every day. Stay informed. You have contracts and contractual agreements that will need to be renegotiated. Costumes have been ordered. Venues selected, possibly paid for. Guest choreographers and artists secured. Performance tours and many more activities. Take this time to work through everything that's in play and come up with a solid plan of action. If you fail to plan, you plan to fail. Lastly, resources. Please, please visit our website as well as others for a lengthy list of resources. They're out there, it's almost overwhelming. So if you don't wanna go down the rabbit hole, you can use the almighty Google, which knows all, you just have to be specific. Um, I found a really good article um, on the site uh, philanthropy.com, which is the chronicle for philanthropy. Uh, it's an article called Responding to the Coronavirus, and another useful article um, in Dance Magazine, which is how dancers and dance organizations and other performing arts organizations can prepare for the financial fallout of COVID-19. So if you have any questions, we are here to help you. Uh, please enter them in the chat. Also, my contact information is on the tab of our website um, where it says meet the IABD team. Thank you. Hopefully that's good information. Great. Thank you so much, Carol. I really, really appreciate you sharing some of uh, those tips and, and recommendations to those who have joined us. Uh, I just want to, I'm um, being asked to just say to everyone, I understand that you all, some of, uh, some folks are experiencing some te technical difficulties. Please use the chat to let us know and we are working on them. Um, if you would 
please um, switch to speaker view so that you can see who's speaking. Some of you mentioned you can't see who's speaking. Uh, so in the Zoom meeting up on the right hand corner, it says speaker view, and you'll be able to see who is actually speaking during the conversation. Um, and also to uh, just a reminder to please mute your audio and uh, stop your video at this moment so we can focus on the speakers. Did I get everything everyone that I needed to remind folks about? Yes? Okay. <laughs> So moving right into um, the conversation, I sent some questions to uh, our panelists to kind of prompt, to begin to prompt our, our conversation this evening. And uh, the three questions I asked them to respond to were as follows. How do artists and arts organizations thrive in tough economic times? We know um, we're, we are in it. So how do we begin to um, move forward? What business measures can artists and arts organizations take in a time of economic recession? Um, we are hearing uh, about our schools uh, being closed, our businesses, restaurants. M many of the things that we take for granted on a day-to-day -day basis are, are closing. We're not having access to income that we would normally have those income streams coming in. So what business measures can we take? And what steps or measures can arts organizations take to support their staff and their artists? I uh, was on a call earlier today and, and we want to continue to support our artists. How do we do that when our uh, revenue streams are, are threatened and or at this point are, are experiencing cancellations and postponements? So I, I prompt these questions to our um, panel. And uh, I want to just, you know, jump right in and, and begin with um, just the first, the very first question. How do artists and arts organizations thrive in tough economic times? And uh, Trella, I'm going to, I'm going to come right to you because <laughs> we literally were just having this conversation on the other day. Uh, thank you, Denise. Um, as you all know, I'm from the Nonprofit Finance Fund and our lens tends to be what are the financial impacts on organizations. But the reality is that, you know, you're, you're doing this because you believe in the art that you're creating. And so one of the things that we're really wanting um, people to take into consideration is, you know, how, how do we, we have this moment where we're in this position and we need to make sure that we're doing a proper assessment of what's happening, looking at the revenue that we may lose as a result of not being able to um, share our crafts. We also want to look at some of the expenses that we will save because we're not being able to share our crafts and figure out what the balance of those two things are. But long term is like, how do we think ahead? How do we really analyze what's happening and how we can prepare so that when we hit these moments, that are so challenging and so catastrophic, we have a plan in place. Um, I encourage you all to reach out to your funders, make no assumptions about how they think about the money that they've given you for the work that you're doing, um, making sure that you let them know what your challenges are. Look at the next two to three months, don't focus on just right now. Um, make sure you're letting them know and then being very, very open and transparent and asking for what you need in this moment and then trying to be able to articulate how you can recover in the future. So that planning is very important because you also need to focus on how you recover, not just how you make it through this period. And with that, I want to make sure other people have time to talk. I'm going to jump right into Shane. Yes, thank you, Shane. Um, you know, from the, the venue perspective, I, I think and it's continuing, how do we continue to engage our communities and not disappear? Uh, what are we, uh, how are we letting you know that we're here, where the rest of the world has changed, but we're still here to support you and, and connect uh, you with each other. And uh, one thing that we um, will be actually launching on Monday is a uh, Wilson Center Ghost Light series, which is a new series we've created starting locally uh, supporting our local artists, uh, performing artists, uh, where we'll select seven artists. Uh, our, our arts council will help curate the program and uh, allow 
our community members uh, to to donate uh, to them uh, through the week um, as they perform, and all that money will go towards the artists. And we typically ask for because then we get into licensing fees and broadcasting fees and all of these uh, uh, other uh, expenses. So we actually chose to, especially with music, focus on original uh, work and public domain work. So um, the, so all those funds can go to support uh, those artists. Um, but uh, that is uh, one thing. There's been a lot of enthusiasm in, in terms of um, we have over 100,000 people within our list uh, for the venue itself. And so even if each person gave a dollar a week, uh, you know, to support these artists that ends up. So um, to support them because immediately they all went out of work across our, our region. And uh, um, we're working with them as well as our part-time staff who now have or reduced hours um, to connect them with resources. And that's the other thing is um, being that clearinghouse for our staff in particular, or so her connecting to social services to um, we're helping uh, some of our staff with uh, getting connected to the federal nutrition program and, uh, and unemployment. So being that resource, um, so I do worry when things rebound, um, what is the brain drain that we, that we might as organizations uh, suffer from? How do, we, how do we help and continue to sustain that brain uh, power that we have and that talent, um, keep them surviving and, and in the area so they don't you know, lose their homes and have to move back home, whatever. So a lot but you know, it's, uh, right now we're starting local and then you know we can be on thank you shane dominique yeah um piggybacking a little bit off of what was said earlier i think um the way carol kicked this off of really thinking about planning as the most important thing right now and having space to be able to do so i think that the other part of that planning and communicating with your funders is important and Charla mentioned that, but also I think it's communicating with your audiences. I know a lot of organizations have had to cancel shows, push shows back or just like group things. And people have bought tickets and you know have made arrangements to attend these things. And I think in times like this, I think we sometimes forget how generous our audiences are and how generous our constituents actually you know, really, our constituents are with us because they believe in what we're doing. Um, so even asking something as simple as, or not, not as simple, but asking something or putting a note out and saying, you know, can you keep, can we keep your ticket price as a donation? How, like, could this money go to support something in, in case you're thinking about as you're canceling things, having to do refunds, et cetera? Um, what is that piece that you can talk with your general, your general reporters, even your general audience members about the resources you need at the organization, um, given the time? Um, and I'd also say start with cash flow so you understand exactly how much of that cash on hand you need to continue operations in, in whatever way and thinking about the priorities of that, of the expenses that you have. Um, and using this time to really be clear and have those priorities down on paper so that when when folks are asking in a couple of weeks how we can support you have some some needs in, in their handy and they're they're well uh, they're data driven and they're they're based in what is actually happening right now. Trella, do you want to add to that? And come off mute. Yes, thank you. Um, I did want to just mention one more part. There are, when I said to you guys, don't be hesitant to go to your funders. Funders are going to be asking you in a very short period of time, what do you need? Um, in addition to that, all over the country, funders are repurposing dollars, they're developing new funds, and they're dedicating new funds in a wide variety of ways. And so knowing what your risk are knowing what you need to go beyond the challenge that you're facing in this next few months as well as how you recover moving forward is going to be really important because you'll need to be able to articulate that to get additional funding. Um, New York is about to launch a huge fund of about $55 million to support New York organizations. Notice I did not say arts organizations, organizations in general. Um, and so the faster you are to where your need sits, the more ready you are in a position to ask for what you need. And that's why we really want to emphasize knowing what you need right now. Great. Uh, 
Andrea and, and Reggie, I'm going to lean a little bit more on, on the business side of things as well, because Andrea, your background is in HR. How can our organizations really support our employees and our artists um, with, you know, what's happening with, with layoffs and, and, and there's no work any longer? Sure, thank you. Um, you know, I think that uh, I was reading an article recently in uh, HBR, Harvard, Harvard Business Review, and it's kind of how to manage in a crisis. So I think that there are some pointers there that I think really stood out in terms of just things that may be common sense to you, but when you're you know, in a state of, of panic and frenetic and times like we're in today, um, you tend to forget those things. So I'm just gonna touch on a few of those and I'm, I'm happy if people are interested in doing uh, further reading in this particular area. But the first one is really to stop and pause and take a breath. You know, and if you take a, you know, anybody who does yoga, dance, all of you know how important breath is to you, right? So taking that breath, giving yourself a chance to kind of clear your mind and think clearly, um, that's a, a great start. Putting yourself in your audience's shoes sometimes is important, and you all have that, those sorts of experiences too. And, and with your staff, how is your staff the audience? How is your staff receiving the information? And being able to be kind in this moment when we're thinking sort of outwardly how are we going to band together how are we going to support concepts that we're doing it's also about being kind to your staff and supporting their needs as well and i think that um you know carol mentioned some references um and referral sources so there may be things there around sort of behavioral health support that folks can get to in a time of you know, uncertainty, being able to do research, which is what she had mentioned that she had done, being clear and confident in what you're talking about and how you're imparting knowledge on your staff and teams, I think is important. And, you know, also having specific next steps. What are you gonna do next? Here's how, here's the plan. Where does it start? Where do you see it potentially ending? We don't know from day to day because things change and shift. But, you know, that gives you a broad spectrum of information to plan with, and then you can communicate that uh, clearly and effectively. Thank you. And sure. Reggie, do you have anything to add from the business perspective? Did we lose him? Can you hear me? Yes, there you are. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry. No um, there are, I was saying that there, if I could cheat a little, actually I have a comment on each of the three areas you ask us questions about thriving in tough economic times, business measures to take and supporting the staff and artists. Sure. Um, the first one, which others have said is, is can't be overemphasized, this notion of transparency. Transparency with all of your stakeholders the funders, the staff, the artists, and the audiences as well. That point has been well made. The second, I think, is in tough times, those who differentiate themselves from all the others who are going through challenges usually rise above the crowd. And that requires you to be resilient, that requires you to be creative. And as, um, as Denise knows, on last Saturday, the Washington Performing Arts had our annual gala, and I was the co-chair of the gala. And on Wednesday, of that same week, it was clear to us that we could not have the gala as we had planned. We quickly turned it into a virtual gala where we actually live stream the performers and the performances and the auctions and all that sort of stuff. And we asked our, our viewers who had paid and either our whole mailing list to, we invited them to uh, come and to watch it live stream. What happened was instead of having 800 people in the room as we had hoped, we had uh, 400 people watch it live stream. And we suspect it was more than 400 because if two people were in a room together, all we could see is that as one person. So we got a large number of people to come. Most of the people so far have made those contributions for the gala, a contribution, did not ask for a refund. And our live auction and silent auctions that were done live stream did better than they had ever before. So this notion of not giving up, hanging in there, which is my third point, is what you have to do and just be creative and resilient and think through things that you can do. Uh, fourth, obviously on the business measures to take, eliminate all of your non-essential expenses. And I know that's tough for us because we operate on thin budgets anyway. So it's not as though we had a lot of non-essential things, 
But the other thing is to proactively negotiate your expenses with your vendors because vendors would rather get something than nothing. And so it, that even includes, you know, staff and salaries and things. So that notion of negotiating your economics is something you should seriously consider. Um, retrenching and focusing on what's really core, which may mean uh, as you look at your performances, whether you have a school or classes, whether you have lecture demonstrations, to really focus on what's most important to us and to retrench where necessary. Um, and then last, in supporting the staff and artists, it first starts with listening to them and collaborating with them and co-creating solutions to the problems with them. So pull them into the challenge versus them just being victims of the challenge. So those are the things that I've seen work before and I would suggest to the group. Thank you so, so very much, Reggie. That, that was uh, amazing. Um, Trella, I'm just gonna uh, pitch it back to you for a moment. We've had a question. No? Uh, she's... Uh, I'm having a hard time getting off mute. Sorry about that. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so there, I, what I mentioned was a fund that's coming. There are quite a few funds that are being developed around the country for organizations that will be announced in the next few weeks. And I'm asking you all to hold tight. We will send the information out to you as they come. Um, I know that the IABD posted one about the Arts Emergency Fund yes. uh, today. There are several coming like that. Um, the, the state of Newark is doing one. New York is doing one. Um, we are t in, in many conversations with funders around the country who are doing one. And also, um, Bonfield Stanton has done some support for Colorado organizations. So we're seeing it everywhere. And that's why we're asking you all to be prepared for what your needs are so that you can ask for them. Great, thank you for uh, providing that information again to everyone. Uh, and so what steps or measures? I mean, we're, we, we've obviously been talking a, a lot about, <laughs> about what's next. Um, but in terms of our, the staff and the artists, I've literally today had a member email me and say, you know, I've had eight plus gigs canceled. Um, I'm not sure if we're going to make this, make this through. What, what are we, and, and or maybe how uh, are we uh, engaging um, with our smaller arts organizations and those that um, do not have the necessary funding in our ability to, to make it through. Are, are there really particular steps or measures? Are we just telling them to, to buckle down? Or, you know, what, what advice, what can we really, um, what information can we provide to, to them, particularly those, you know, smaller, um, small to mid-sized uh, organizations, and also, of course, our, our individual artists and performers? I could uh, just jump in. Uh, I want to go off of uh, what Trella said earlier about that, that $55 million fund. You know, that was not particularly geared towards arts organizations, but of course is applicable. And we as uh, those in the arts community, um, you know, sometimes feel that, oh, we're, you know, we're all independent, we're artists, we're not part of, you know, the, you know, oh, that's not me, I'm not, that's not applicable to me. We are a collectively, as a collective, a major driver for our, our, our nation. And an essential, we provide essential services and employment for our nation. And so remembering that uh, when we're looking at these programs, that even though it's not arts focused or does not say anything about artists, um, that it, um, that we are, you know, that in most cases we are applicable to these programs. So I, I guess look past whether it says artist or not. and. Uh, and, and apply for it. Um, I just wanna um, make sure that we don't put ourselves in a box. Great. Anyone else on the panel wanna to respond to that? I'll respond, Shane. I think that is so important. I think it really connects to a lot of our telling your, I would call it telling your financial story, but I'll expand it to really telling your organizational story. Um, so a lot of organizations, even, even if you, as, even in the arts, if you're thinking about the connections you make to 
I don't want to call them this, but the things that people would typically go are essential services. Like I, I think all of the work that everybody does for the sector is essential. So like really just getting yourself out of that mindset that is sometimes placed in the arts that like it's not essential and that's not true, but making that connection so in front of people that they can't ignore it, like talking about the community building that's happening in the organization, even through even through this isolation, how are you still building community through your networks? How are you still educating folks? How are you still um, really providing those valuable services and connecting that to the impact that your organization will feel if um, there is no recovery or there is no support from the funding community? Um, and, and like really connecting that impact to the stuff that you're doing. Um, so that might suggest. Yeah. And if I could continue on, we're, what we do is the only thing right now to, uh, in terms of, we have the power to create community like no one else. Netflix is not creating a community. And, you know, people are sitting home watching Netflix and Hulu, but we can, through the power of streaming, we have amazing technology at our fingertips. Um, you know, we're starting locally, but we are uh, in talks with companies around the country. And we'd love to start streaming. Uh, performances um, once we get past those logistics so we can start getting revenue into artists hands uh, getting you know revenue into the venue so we can get uh, on our feet and continuing to build community and allowing us to serve as that that community builder builder and that forum for for all of those around us um, we we are in a we are placed in a very wonderful position if we want to grasp it and and maintain that connection Thank you. Um, Reggie, I'm going to ask you another question that's a, a little bit more on the business side of things. And uh, I heard this uh, earlier today on another webinar that I um, participated in and would love your, your perspective, um, particularly for organizations that uh, have already sunk in some costs in non-recoverable costs <laughs> into touring and, and uh, some you know flights and, and things uh, that are no longer occurring. What, how can an organization respond? What, what might be um, a way that they might recover or perhaps not recover uh, some of those costs? Um, and, and just thinking about you know, our organizations that were touring and, and say specifically, um, I know Joe Myers Brown is on, on the phone. They were in Germany when this broke out. It had a, a I think a 12 city tour happening. We're not able to complete it. Um, I think they got through about five cities. Of course it was successful, uh, but what about the, the loss of revenue for uh, that organization and, and that particular tour? Any advice? On yeah, that? A, yeah, a couple of things. One, certainly these funds that we've been talking about, to some extent are hopefully geared towards helping you recover situations like that. So where funding along that lines exists, you should go for it. Certainly some of our historical funders and patrons understand what we've gone through and therefore you can make a special plea to help us recover money that was lost as a result of this thing happening in the middle of a tour. The other thing some people have done is try to renegotiate with the bookers so that we don't cancel the tours but we just move them so that we still can do that again and, and the flights and the hotel and all those arrangements to try to move those to 18 months off or 12 months off so that it, it doesn't help the cash flow situation, but it, it uh, hopefully allows you not to make that a complete loss. Beyond that, I'm not sure what else one could do. Great. Thank you so much. Um, go ahead, Shane. I just wanted I just wanted to tag on to that uh, that that uh, focusing on postponement rather than cancellation I think is 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 um, to, to we uh, we built this relationship with this artist we're saying they're coming to our community I think we owe it to our communities to to come through and bring these artists to our community we also owe it to our artists um, to bring them here so I as a as a presenter, I think we have a responsibility to follow through with our commitment to our artists, uh, you know, to the best of our ability to get them um, back and to hold on to our commitments. And so I, I do challenge all our presenters to do what they can to uh, maintain uh, those uh, agreements. Um, because if we, if we lose our artists, then what good are our venues and what good are our presenters? 
Thank you. Denise, I'd like to add a pretty technical conversation around having employees, how we are treating our dancers, um, and, and our ability to lay them off, furlough them, et cetera, and so on. And there's a lot of um, details with how nonprofits negotiate and deal with unemployment insurance. And I'm going to kick that to Andrea to follow up on this because I don't know the details. There's also a lot of government mandates that are asking states and states are also volunteering to relax some of those rules. So this is very, very technical and specific. But long story short, some of us are looking at furloughing people, laying people off, all of those things have very different consequences to the nonprofit organization, particularly if in your state you are exempt from paying unemployment taxes and then you find yourself with a tax bill because you didn't realize that you had to pay them if you lay someone off and they go and collect unemployment. So I just want to make sure that people are aware of some of those nuances and also aware that the government is giving some passes and relaxing some of those guidelines because of the state that we're in right now. So I just want to name that because it definitely affects how you're calculating your losses right now and kick it to Andrea to provide a little bit more from the HR perspective, the details around that. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Trilla. Yeah, yeah it, it's and absolutely Denise, true. Denise, can, I make, can I make one more point? Sure. I'm, I'm sorry, this is Reggie. I'm sorry, I, what I neglected to say when we talked about postpone versus cancel, in some contracts, there are force majeure clauses that do include pandemics. Some have acts of God that don't include, but some do include pandemics. So I would say uh, you should look very carefully at any written contracts you have to see if there's a force majeure clause that will be helpful to you. Sorry about that. Well, thank you. Andrea? Yeah, so, you know, I think that Unemployment insurance is a, a potential opportunity, depending on, as Trella mentioned, how you're organized and whether you're paying um, unemployment insurance on a continuing basis versus if you're doing it by, um, you know, how often you think you'll have some sort of activity around unemployment. Um, so those are things to look at, to go back and look at how you were actually set up, whether you've been paying unemployment or not and, and withholding that, or if you've been paying it on a quarterly basis, because those things are different. Uh, some states are different also in the way that they are, are working through the unemployment insurance plans. Um, I know because I'm in New York that New York is doing a, there's usually a waiting period, like with any insurance, you know, there's that elimination period. So New York is waiving that seven day waiting period for people to be able to file for unemployment insurance. I tried to do a quick look up to see if I could look up some other states to see if they're also following, following suit with that. Um, I'm not sure, I wasn't able to get that information, but I'm happy to you know, provide that later so I can do kind of a scan of, of various states to see um, what are things that people should be aware of and be looking out for in terms of uh, unemployment insurance. Also, the length of time that you can collect unemployment has also been relaxed. And, it, and also, I'm, I'm thinking that, I, I read this somewhere, that it used to be that you had to be employed for 26 continuous weeks prior to um, filing for that. So that I think has also become more flexible right now. Of course, again, you've got to check state to state, but I think that the flexibility will enhance, you know, people's ability to get some income flow in, even if it's minimal. Great. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to ask the panelists, are there any last um, remarks that you have before we open this up for Q&A to our audience that's joined us this evening? I want to make sure that we have uh, ample time to try and answer some of the questions that are coming through. No? All right. Uh, we're going to ask everyone then to um, slowly come off video <laughs> so we can see your lovely faces uh, for our conversation. Um, and we're going to open uh, this uh, up for questions from those who have joined us. Please use the chat to ask the question. And I will repeat the question and direct it to one of our panelists. 
And if you could tell me specifically if you have a question specific for someone on the panel, um, I can direct it to them as well in the chat. All right, everyone's starting to come off. Um, I do have a note here from Ms. Charmaine Jefferson, who is an independent arts consultant out on the West Coast and has done uh, some really wonderful work with IEBD and some of our member organizations uh, in response to uh, Ms. Briscoe to check your local state arts council. In California, they have created a form for addressing impact from cancellations and will work with you on a case by case basis. Uh, someone has noted, could the host unlock the video? They're having problems unlocking the video. Great. All righty. Um, one of, we have a question here um, from Portia on Facebook. Uh, do you anticipate summer intensives being shut down too? So we're talking uh, June, July, August is typically when we see summer intensives um, occurring here in our community. And I know many of you all who are on this call actually are running summer intensives. Um, have you thought about it? Um, have you thought about whether or not you are in a position to uh, continue uh, with that type of programming? I have personally not heard of any summer intensive cancellations yet. I do know that there are programs that are canceling now through, through um, May and June, maybe some in uh, July and August, but they're kind of more along season programming, but I have not heard of summer intensives. Is there anyone on the call who has made some decisions about a summer intensive uh, that they might be uh, holding and whether or not they are considering canceling? You would have to come off mute first in order for us to hear you. Denise, this is Trella. I'll just add that some of the stuff I've heard is that there is a concern that people will not be in a financial position to pay for summer intensives. Um, and so the analysis that we've encouraged is to look at what your percentage of payment is now. Um, you know, how many people have put deposits down and made payments to help make that decision right now if you're going to make it this early otherwise continue to hold off until you get closer to the intensive thank you trella anyone else have have you made a decision about a summer intensive program as to whether or not you will be uh, canceling it no response okay i will go to the no, amanda standard oh. is commenting in the chat she said extending training through the 12 months for the student body with guest master teachers is part of their contingency plan plan right and tamika washington miller just said my kids school just called to say they would be online until may 1st this means that class may start back up in the summer or we may or we may be within the same status of holding. Um, question from Tiffany Ray Fisher to uh, Shane. Uh, Shane, what are you hearing from other presenters regarding their summer and fall seasons? Oh goodness, it's, uh, I'd say it's a little early. Um, there's still a lot of, uh, Yes, a lot of things happening, but I, what I am seeing are some domino effects with tours. Uh, right now, programming, you know, is most everywhere is canceled through April, but now I'm seeing uh, late April now kind of collapsing and into May um, because the tours cannot sustain, you know, those, you know, those that were routed through April and May, um, you know, if they were um, routed uh, through parts of the country, and, and so those are being rescheduled. Um, beyond that, we're, I know we're holding and a lot of other venues are holding what we can, uh, May and beyond. Our, we're still selling tickets. Uh, we have moved our ticketing off-site and forwarded phones. So, um, and the, this is very promising. We put 
three shows on sale last week uh, at the beginning of this, and two sold out, and one uh, was over 50% sold on the first day. So I, and these are programs which are in the fall. So I will say that right now, um, our, our ticket buyers that we're seeing are still committed to it, um, uh, committed to the programming. Uh, they're, they're already getting cabinet fever and they, they're looking forward to the future. So I think that's a good sign. So I, I'm seeing enthusiasm for the future, um, you know, in terms of programming now. We're, again, we're trying to do what we can to postpone and, uh, and get new dates established as soon as possible. We know that the faster we can get a date announced, that will stop the bleeding with requests for refunds. And so that's, um, that's very important, is trying to race to get um, boring reestablished, uh, you know, in terms of routing uh, with our other sister venues. Um, so we can go ahead and, and confirm dates, because I think that's, a, that's key too, to kind of maintain that solvency for those programs. We already spent money on marketing for these programs and to spend more, um, we don't have the funding for that. So I think that is key, is to get things reestablished in new dates. Um, you know, later into the year. Um, so I, it's kind of where where we are right now and taking it day by day. Who knows, may all change tomorrow. But. Thank you, Shane. Great. This is Charmaine. Hi, Charmaine. Hi. Um, so I, I'm going to assume that most of you have heard enough of the news to know that one, the cases for people who are under 54 are much higher than they expected. We did. Um, that's one. They're all here in California. They've just asked all of the malls and in other places like that to shut down. So I'm going to propose that there should be some thought as you're planning ahead or thinking about the future, including the ticket sales. And, and I just sent a note that says I'm a trustee at CalArts and our school has shut down through the end of the semester with the exception of online. And that includes our Performing Arts Center. Assuming we came back online and everyone was, and we would have graduated in May and the graduation has been canceled. I mean, that don't mean, doesn't mean people won't graduate, but there won't be a graduation. Assuming we were to come back on line in business in June, the number of people that will be out of work at this moment, including all of the folks who have just been laid off that are hourly all over the place, I think it is reasonable for us to assume as a business that we will have a lot of patrons who might not have been sick, who are fine, who are ready to get back to business, but don't have cash. Right. So the one conversation we haven't spent any time on is the economic impact follow-up of this that may mean that even though we're ready to dance, this, the, the loose cash might not be there for another couple months thereafter. So I would just suggest that if we are trying to book or sell tickets for something, if we don't want to get caught with having to give back a whole lot of money, unless you're just trying to, you know, rob Peter to pay Paul and figure out how to keep things going, that you, which I'm not necessarily encouraging per se, that we might not want to assume that people are buying tickets to our performances until August or September. That's just a thought. I wanna hear a conversation about it. Yeah, um, we're gonna, I'm just gonna open, ask everyone, uh, if you'd like to respond or ask a question, we have a, a, enough people on here that it will not um, interfere with your reception. So if you would like to, uh, open up and respond to that, that's fine. Um, 
that is something I have to say, uh, Charmaine, that I actually had a conversation um, with uh, Omar Ingram, our programs director, and, and Adriana Ray, our development director, earlier today, that you know, even if we do rebound, will the people be able to rebound? Will the cash flow um, be there for folks to participate in our activities, even though we are online. And we are we are hearing, um, just as you're saying, that it they're going to be it'll be slow for them to catch up. That it will be slow if you've been out of work, you've got bills, you've got all of the other things, life that you will be slow to catch up to want to spend the dollars uh, um, in, in our industry. And so that, that is a concern. Um, we've been thinking about that. Um, even with our, our, comp, our conference and festival uh, that takes place, you know, in January of 2021, um, literally, you know, what, two or three days ago, Charlie and Dominique, you, you know, I brought that to your attention on our conversation. Um, are we going to be able to have um, attendance at a major event, even for this organization? And, and that is, you know, our, our big, our big baby, as we call her. And so what about that? Um, and we are also traveling out of the country. So in 2021, we are in Toronto, Canada. So that, that is something that we've started to, you know, put in the ether and um, begin to really think about and, and, and things are already in place. Some deposits are down, contracts with hotels are signed. Um, so, you know, when Reggie mentioned force majeure, is that something we want to enact now in order to, you know, these are all the things, um, all the things that we, we need to be thinking about. So I do thank you for raising that. Is, is there anyone else who would like to respond to Charmaine's comment? I'll jump hey. in. I'll go ahead. Okay. Hey, are you? Lena? You just went off, yes. Okay, I'm still here. So um, in response to Charmaine, one of the things that we have been working on, we had to cancel the Leopard Tail, our spring signature ballet. 30th anniversary. Uh, 30th anniversary. So um, it would have been, um, well, our opening Postpone. would have been tonight. So we postponed it. So we were using Eventbrite and they started to hold money for our last set of tickets, which was good. So we're kind of in limbo in that we put postpone. Many of the people love the leopard tail, so they're stating that they will hold off in hopes that we can reschedule. But as you know, it's hard to get a theater in Atlanta, right? So we're dealing yes. with that aspect of it. So many of the parents who were involved with their children involved with the leopard tail are asking us how they may help. So. Our major thing is solidifying our stability in terms of the Academy of Dance. So we've asked the parents to pay their tuition. We're in the middle of March. We need our March you know, auto draft tuition, which comes out on Friday. That will give us a good idea of where we stand. So we have a really strong um, BPO, Balletic Parent Organization Chair. And she's really working to make sure people solidify and pay their tuition through May. And then we're working on alternative ways to do our uh, May open house performance. And then the parents are also talking in terms of staff stability, if we need support, um, we're coming up with what those numbers are. So the two major things are make sure people continue to commit to paying tuition. We're looking at our online presence for presenting classes and getting that kind of information out as well as private classes as long as we can still come out during the day and solidifying ourselves through May. Um, working on doing something a little bit different the end of July, depending on what happens. And then probably looking to reschedule the leopard tail feasibly um, mid to late August and a different experience being that the theater um, problem is so prevalent here. Wow. Thank you. Uh, I, I wanna raise a question from Abdo that was placed in the chat a moment ago. 
Uh, Abdo asks, how can we find balance between the humanity aspect of the crisis, making sure that our artists get paid and the finances of the organization? I'll be happy to talk about one plan that we have initiated. Um, we actually initiated it uh, two years ago. It's uh, Broadway for a Better World. It's a program that allows donors to contribute to a fund, which allows uh, uh, any nonprofit in our region to apply for tickets to any show. And, and so uh, our donors fund the purchase of those tickets and uh, organizations apply. Our Arts Council actually has agreed they do all of the selection and review of the applications. Um, and right now we've been able to fund every, um, every uh, application uh, that has come in. And, uh, and so I'm working right now with donors to beef that up so that we can continue, especially as um, those uh, most vulnerable and affected in our population will not have the capacity to purchase tickets that they will still be able to attend performances. Um, and then as a venue, we'll still be able to pay the artists from the revenue coming in. So, um, and that's on our website if you wanted to. I'm happy to send that model to any presenters out there who are interested, but it allows us to um, truly have the facility accessible to everyone in the community uh, and um, also um, allow us to maintain um, our financial uh, stability. Would you be willing to share just how much um, the grants are that you're providing? Um, right now, it's um, each, each organization can apply for up to 15 tickets. Um, and the program just had its two-year-old birthday uh, this, uh, this uh, last, um, I guess this last January. And we distributed over $100,000 uh, in two years. Um, and so it is something um, when people buy a ticket, they'll buy a ticket for themselves or you know, whatever their family, and then they'll buy a ticket for, um, for someone in this program. So it's, uh, um, we do see a lot of that. I mean, our, our ticket buyers, we you know, make it clear that you have the privilege to come to this venue and experience these performances, but most do not. And, and how are you um, going to help share that experience with others in our community? And people have been responding to that. And I think now more than ever, uh, this uh, program is so important, uh, especially looking into, into our people. Great. Um, we had uh, two of our attendees uh, it, right in our uh, chat. And so Joni Carroll, who is with um, Hadat Hill Dance Academy Theater in Pittsburgh. Uh, she's a teaching artist, um, but she's also a pharmacist. Noted here that for individual artists who are looking for temp work, we've seen here in Pittsburgh that local grocery stores and pharmacies are working with organizations impacted by closures to get people temporary jobs and working in the stores as soon as possible, stocking shelves overnight, serving as extra uh, delivery drivers. Um, something worth, worth asking about in your communities if individual artists are looking for immediate uh, temporary work. And then Amanda Standard uh, also mentioned um, uh, in the same plan, we looked and postponed production and showcases to October and December. And this was in response to, I believe, summer uh, intensives. Um, so I just also wanted to add uh, two things for anybody in the state of California. Gavin Newsom just ordered a stay at home order for all of California. So we're now officially on lockdown, just happened. Um, oh. <laughs> if you're not if you're not in California um but but to, to Abdo's question which I think is va very valid and really the essence of all the work that we do is like how do we juggle the mission and the money and for us the mission is is making sure that our artists and our art is out there and and happening and then but we got to figure out how to make it happen and pay for it and you know there's always this balance Charmaine named that this could be a much longer impact. And, and so when we started this conversation, we were saying, actually identify what is the loss to you? What, what does that look like? And so when you're thinking about your assessment of what does it look like, you need to consider three, six, nine, 12 months of impact. 
what, you know, don't just stop at, we think this is going to be over in June. And I think that's the ongoing theme here is, yes, we might be back online in June, but everybody may not be functioning in June, or we may not be back online in June. Um, you know, so make sure that when you're, you're assessing, you're assessing as far out as your your brain will allow you to process <laughs> um, and, and reassessing what this will be to your organization. But as you make those assessments, um, so many of you have come up with amazing, beautiful, creative opportunities and ideas in the art. So don't, you know, hesitate to be able to look long term. Maybe we should do more of this. Maybe we should create in a different way right now so that you are in a position to capitalize in, in that way. Thank you, Trella. Uh, there's a question here or a statement from uh, Kayla Harley. Uh, Tama, which is Teaching Artists of the Mid-Atlantic, has a pre-drafted letter of which organizations can expound upon their needs and the impact of COVID-19 on their personal income, their programs, their performances, projects, et cetera. And you could submit this to your elected officials. Um, certainly, um, the other area we hadn't touched upon is advocacy. Um, I could say that on our resources page, we um, provide uh, a link to your House of Representatives and your senators. You, please advocate, not only for yourselves, but for the community. They do have to know what's going on. Um, there is legislation that is being drafted and being passed and, and being discussed. And we wanna make sure that your voices are heard and a, and a part of that. So please make sure that um, if you have the time, which I'm sure you do now, please write those letters and make sure you touch base with um, your representatives on the federal, state, local levels, all across the board. That is very, very, very important. So Denise, I just have a quick comment on that. Yes. And, and that is that the uh, HR uh, 6201 uh, Families First Coronavirus Response Act was signed recently. And what that essentially does was, it was immediately signed. So it's gonna extend, uh, again, the Families First Coronavirus Response Act, um, which provides a number of things um, around food resources, um, paid leave, uh, a number of, it, as I mentioned before, extending that unemployment insurance and that was already signed. So we're gonna see how that works out. That also provides some medical care like respirators and um, extended Medicaid benefits. Again, food, particular food resources, supplemental food resources and um, the unemployment pieces. Right. And then Charmaine Jefferson noted that Amazon, if it is in your community, is hiring uh, 100,000 people for delivery of essentials. Because right now, everything is online. Um, artists still have to eat and be able to um, be healthy, uh, shelter in place. And so as dance leaders, we also need to help our artists to know that it is OK to also focus on survival. And in the chat, um, the HR 6201 Families First Coronavirus Response Act is there with the link. So if you uh, want to go to that and uh, get more information, it is provided there. Um, I Quail, you had started to speak. Uh, did you have something you wanted to say? Yeah, sure. Thank you, Denise. Um, sure. uh, thank, and thanks for this town hall. I, I just wanted to elevate the importance and the impact of people who are working as solo artists and individuals. And a lot of the information and conversation is framed around those that have human resources in particular to be able to manage all of the work that is required. And I wanted to elevate the fact that a lot of us that don't have staff are now inundated in a way in which the effects of which will cripple them going forward, meaning if universities are closed, we don't have the interns that could do the work um, that fill out some of these forms. Um, and I'm not sure if anybody else is feeling it as much as I'm feeling that, you know, what is the, the, the 
sort of impact or the way forward for those that are, are solo organizations or people who only have one staff, how do you forecast? How do you have those conversations with funders and negotiate with presenters, keep your operations afloat, pay your dancers when you're only doing it by yourself? That's my first point. I think the second point, um, we talk a lot about bad actors in terms of funding, uh, funders. I will say that I had a conversation with a funder about extending the, the deadline for their, up, their most recent grant application and they <laughs> flat out told me no. Um, they flat out said that they have a lot of work to do to get the panels ready and uh -huh. they were not extending, and this was a state agency, they were not extending the deadline. Um, even after advocating that I'm an organization of one full-time employee and I depend on interns, they didn't care and asked me to get it in by the 16th. So I also want to elevate that as well as part of the conversation um, because we haven't talked about that or how to navigate that as well. Like how do you continue to keep pushing forward, push back against the field, but also not burn bridges um, while you're trying to survive and make sure your artists eat and you eat. I would ask you, Iquail, to send uh, me and IBD that particular agency's information. We can advocate. I, I, I don't mind stepping in. I think we, there are so many examples of others that have um, stated that they are, you know, they are pivoting. <laughs> That's my term, <laughs> you know, that they are shifting and they are allowing um, for organizations to respond in, in time that, you know, certainly they want to get information in, but they're giving you the time. So I, I would ask you to um, forward me that information and, and I will see who I might be able to reach out to in that, uh, on that level um, to speak with that particular uh, agency. Of course, I can't make any promises, but, but we can certainly advocate for you. And Denise, NFF okay. would gladly join in that conversation because um, okay. we're doing the same type of advocacy and have articles, et cetera, published on that as well. And this is Charmaine. I, I sent a note on here that the California Arts Council as an impact form for those who are in California who may be being impacted by um, canceled performances, et cetera, and they're gonna try and deal with it on a case-by-case -case basis. Given that it is likely that the filing for the payment of federal taxes will get delayed by almost 90 days, um, here in, in Los Angeles, um, requirements that had people doing their, their ethics reviews and then there and other kinds of filings are having been delayed but more importantly i also am a commissioner for the los angeles cultural affairs commission so i'm happy to help drop my name on anything that helps encourage others to recognize that this is the gig economy our field is part of that gig economy all over the nation and we can we can put voices out there to help try and get those things changed um, and there are also some funding entities like grant makers for the arts and et cetera, who we, who we could think about sending letters to and asking them to talk to private funders about it. So I'm happy to help any way I can. Yeah. And, and I know on, on this call, we have um, some representatives from not only our private sector, but also uh, foundations as well who are hearing this. And um, we could certainly ask um, for their support as well. We're, well, we will help you, IQUIL. And if anyone else is experiencing that, um, please let us know here at IEBD. And Denise, I'm stepping a little bit out of bounds, but I saw Malik's post about yeah. equity, and I'm like, yeah. yes, let me talk about that. <laughs> Well, um, I'm glad Malik brought it up. We, we only have a few um, minutes left, so I think it's appropriate that, you know, we talk about it. Um, and I, I will just say, um, again, I've been on some calls these last couple of days, and racial equity, <laughs> in, this, in this era of, you know, <laughs> diversity, equity, inclusion, access, opportunity, you name it, um, I am failing to see uh, in these conversations, that lens being utilized in the in in the conversations, um, it is unfortunate and it speaks volumes. However, to um, what I feel has just become a, another 
um, you know, another speakeasy in a way that people just speak really easy about it, but you don't really see the action behind it. Um, I have been on calls where, where folks of color are not represented and we have plenty of people in this sector and other sectors who should be a part of the conversations. Decisions are being made um, without our input. Uh, I have been starting to contact people about it because it's, it's very disheartening um, in, in a way. And as Malik just stated here, black communities are still reeling from the 2008 recession. This may be harder on a government level, but can IBD come together with NALAC and potentially NPN and others to advocate for funding that centers racial equity? It still remains an issue as much as we have, you know, equity and inclusion and diversity on the tip of our tongues. We don't see it. We do not see it actualizing itself. It's just not happening. So I would be more than happy, uh, Malik and others who are on this call, to really have a real conversation around how we can, as a community, advocate for ourselves in that way. Uh, because currently we, we are being left out of those conversations. Um, luckily, you know, a funder did reach out to me this past weekend, and I was just really floored and excited about the fact that they stated to me, I recognize that your organization and your name is, uh, is, are not being mentioned in these conversations, and I am purposely putting you in them. Do you mind? And I said, absolutely not. Uh, so this, it is still an unfortunate reality um, <laughs> that we have to continue to grapple with. Um, and I, I know uh, my founders who are on this phone have been doing this and hearing this mm -hmm. for decades. <laughs> so <laughs> yes, we know, I was waiting. You, you, know, <laughs> yes. you know I was waiting, honey. Yes. Just, you know, I just can't tell you how, um, how important this town hall meeting is. It's is more important than any town hall meeting I've seen on, the, on CNN. <laughs> I, if you know what I mean, because it's relative and um, our community is not heard. The, dad, the arts community is not heard. The black dance, the, the artists of color are not heard. And for us to try to just get into any of these kind of forums has been very challenging. And, um, you know, I wanna, I wanna respond to how do we do, deal with the humanity and also the business? And I think that's where we are a significant organization to each one of us in our communities. And we serve like communities that people don't even recognize that we serve. And so it's beyond that. But um, I just don't know how we can get some of the feedback from our community that says, we need you, we need you to do whatever we need to do, but we need to see and feel the art because it feeds our soul. I mean, it's, I'm worried about people's mental, spiritual space that, um, that, I mean, you know, if we're staying in our own homes, that's fine, we have to do it. But when that is, is the ban is over, I think we have to recover as quickly as the symphony, the opera, the ballet, all of our institutions. And we have to be looked at in that same way as those, those critical organizations that feed us um, in terms of the arts are vital. So I just don't know, I just love the panel. I mean, some of the things that we heard tonight, I've been taking, I have 12 pages of notes. I just want to pin what it was, but the notes are critical. We bring it back to the staff. Um, what, what you have done, Denise, with the leadership is just phenomenal. We have to have advocacy and I keep thinking our organizations can provide that for other communities and, and, and individual artists, but we have to feel stable first. I mean, and we're not feeling stable right now. I'm sure no one is, but we want to reach out because we, we touch so many, I mean, the, the companies that we had to cancel in our own organization was unbelievable, but we're trying to bring in, in May, our own concert. It's our 50th anniversary in the middle of all of this. We'll remember this one. And um, we were hosting Dance USA and so many things. We're doing the capital campaign. Many things have come to a halt, but I think it provides ways for us to communicate. And like Carol says, communicate, communicate, communicate. So I hope this isn't the last time that we get to hear each other and talk about how do we really support one another and be as effective as we can be. But each, each state is, is challenging. We just heard about California and it's very devastating. It's very frightening. 
but um, our hearts are with you and we send love and people stay safe. And um, Philip Bailey's manager just asked if I would make a statement tonight about stay in and stay safe. And then I want to say, and stay, stay productive and creative and loving and kind, really. Thank you, Cleo. We really needed that. <laughs> Not, we really now let's needed. dance. Let's, let's do the cor coronavirus yes. dance. And the, I mean, like Maya Angela would say, I hope you dance. I hope yes. you dance. Yes. We can't stop dancing. It might be a new dance, a new choreography, but we have to dance. Thank you, Cleo. Thank you. Thank you, honey. Thank you all. Uh, just to recap, IBD has a survey. I would ask all of you all on this um, Zoom meeting this evening in this town hall, participating in this town hall to please complete our survey. Um, yes, there are a number of surveys out. Ours only takes six minutes. I know y'all got this amount of time. <laughs> it's very, very quick. We would ask you to complete it out complete it because we are also um, getting that information, we're gathering it, and we are going to be sharing it uh, as well with our funders, with uh, those who are advocating um, on behalf of, of this community. And we, again, we want our information included in these discussions. Um, the link to the survey has been placed in the, in the chat room. It's on our website as well. Uh, so you can click on that link, literally take six minutes. Um, we're just trying to get a gauge of what's happening um, with you individually and your organizations. Uh, in addition, if you need the emergency planning assistance, we are here to assist. Um, Carol Foster is here, IEBD is here. Uh, we are on the steering committee um, for the Performing Arts Readiness uh, Project. Um, IEBD is uh, on that committee and uh, we are meeting um, with uh, other organizations to really discuss planning um, and preparing for emergencies and disasters and pandemics. Um, as, as we are currently encountering. So please make sure that you um, reach out to us about any emergency preparedness planning. Um, there are a few more things here in the chat from Charmaine. The world needs to just know how many of you are out there. Is there a way to send in dance segments from the IBD membership reflecting it dancing for health and creating for the future. Something that will capture the attention of folks looking for positives. Yes, the Ailey link on the internet today was great. Uh, Debbie Allen did um, the class. Uh, John Legend was online with a free concert. Viva Brazil did the same. Um, yes, I will speak with our small but mighty staff <laughs> about trying to make some of that available and seeing what we can do just to make sure that we are seen and that we are heard and that the creatives um, are, are, are recognized uh, as well. Yes, help us make IBD and you go national is what she says. Uh, and then lastly, Dominique mentioned, speaking of representation, NFF has been talking to funders and investors about what nonprofits need and what is most important right now. There is a their link to their survey as well. It takes three to five minutes for them. But I quail just said there's like a whole bunch of surveys, so we got to figure out how we Sorry. can present. No, it's fine. I was, uh, I'm, I'm recognizing. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's happening right now, but it's we need to collect the information, so we need to figure out how we can help help organizations do that. But Charlie, that also answers Charmaine's question is like well, a lot of times nonprofit finance fund put surveys out. We don't hear from the black community. So if we don't get your voices and we're like, no, 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 they need, they need, they need. They're like, mm, we didn't hear from them though. So we're, you know, we're trying to, to advocate for you all to try to respond if you can. It, it, it definitely helps to elevate what the issues are. Okay. So we just need to come up with some way though that we can help others to fill no. out yeah to actually do it i think yep. we're getting the inf i think we're hearing we're getting the information but it's the time um, right that it takes and and the real bandwidth from one person to do 10 surveys or like right now i know of four IABD, NFF, Dance USA, Dance NYC, I think grant makers i mean you know there are all of these surveys uh, out here 
Um, but that then it goes back to this, and I will close with this. We got to come together. When we talk about everybody being at the table, then everybody has to be at that big old table together in order for us to really move this forward. Um, I thank you all so, so, so very much. Um, yes, Shane, you can share it. <laughs> thank you everyone so, so very much. We're gonna, I, I'm laying this on my staff now, but we're gonna do another one of these. Uh, I wanna focus on just the artist community next. I think oh, I need to hear from my artists as well. Um, but this has been really great. I appreciate, appreciate you all uh, being on this call. And again, reach out to IBD. We are here for you and we will be back in touch with you all very, very, very soon. Have a great evening, everyone. Take care. Thank I'm you, gonna... Denise and staff. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Right. Marvin Gaye.